Good afternoon, um, Your Highnesses, Excellences, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, a warm welcome to Secretary uh, Blinken. Thank you. Uh, coming uh, to uh, this special meeting. Uh, we know that uh, you've been uh, traveling the world also the last week, uh, been in China. I at least read in the media that you're heading uh, to Israel uh, tomorrow. And um, what a complicated world. Mm. Uh, we have had this summit now for two days, and uh, I think the conclusion has been that the global economy mm. is doing a lot better than expected especially the U.S. economy, mm. but geopolitically we are in a kind of a recession. <laughs> uh, and uh, you uh, also has a big task in, in maneuvering this, and we know that the uh, decisions we're making now will also have consequences uh, for uh, many years to come. We're kind of between world orders. We had one mm. world order, and we don't know uh, really what the next one is. And I think everyone, before we go into the more regional situations, uh, would like to hear uh, your aspirations uh, for uh, the world. What kind of world order does the Biden administration and you personally aspire for, Secretary? Okay, thanks very much. It's, it's great to be with you. Great to be with so many colleagues here. Uh, wonderful as well to have the full uh, World Economic Forum experience, having been in Davos and now having been here, so um, couldn't be better. Uh, and you're right that uh, this is a, a moment of particular challenge. Um, it's a moment of challenge because in many ways, as President Biden likes to say, we're at an inflection point. Uh, there are fundamental changes taking place in terms of geopolitical uh, competition, uh, but also uh, global challenges that no country can effectively address alone, where the decisions that we make in these moments are likely to have repercussions not just for the next few years, but for decades to come. That's what he means, that's what we mean by an inflection point. So for us, the, the, the starting point in dealing with this um, effectively is to make sure that um, we're well organized. And what do we mean by that? For for President Biden, for the United States in this moment uh, and over the last three years, we started with a proposition that, um, again, uh, we can't effectively do uh, and meet these challenges uh, alone, as large and as powerful as the United States is. And so he's put a premium on revitalizing, reimagining, reinvigorating alliances, partnerships uh, around the world uh, in every corner, and making sure that we were working together with different groupings of countries that were fit for particular purposes. Um, and so you see it in everything we've done to strengthen existing alliances and partnerships. Uh, you've seen it in everything uh, we've done also to reimagine some new ones, to bring countries together in common purpose. We have a glo global coalition now to deal with synthetic opioids that are afflicting uh, so many countries. Uh, coalitions of countries to work on infrastructure investment, on global health as well as on these big geopolitical uh, challenges. And I think that organization, that foundation, has actually helped us do uh, well and do effectively in meeting some of these uh, big problems, big challenges. Uh, two quick examples. On Ukraine, we were able to bring so many countries together, uh, not just in Europe but beyond, because countries recognized that there was an aggression not only against Ukraine, but against some of the foundational principles of the international system. Uh, and if uh, we let that challenge go with impunity, then it was likely that would-be aggressors everywhere would take note, and we would have a world of more conflict, not less conflict. And having brought many countries together effectively, uh, we helped the incredibly courageous Ukrainians repel the aggression. Now, it's an ongoing effort, an ongoing struggle, but the designs that Vladimir Putin had on Ukraine to begin with, to erase it from the map, to subsume it into Russia so that it no longer existed, that's failed. And we also have an alliance in, in Europe that's stronger, that's also larger uh, than it was, um, and I think a plan uh, to enable Ukraine to be a success uh, over, uh, over time, a strong country militarily, economically, democratically. In Asia, we have um, 
the most consequential and in many ways complicated relationship uh, with China. It can't be defined in a bumper sticker, but we've approached it from a position of strength. The aspects where we're competitive, the aspects where we're cooperative, the aspects where we're contesting. And that strength has to do with the fact that there's now greater convergence than at any time I can remember between us, key partners in Europe, key partners in Asia, and in other places on approaching some of the challenges posed by China. I just came back, as you noted from there, and I think that's very much something that they, they see and understand. And of course, in this moment, we have arguably the worst crisis in the uh, Middle East since um, 1948, and we're addressing it, working on it together with partners throughout the region, trying to bring the conflict in, in Gaza to an end, trying to ensure that it doesn't spread, um, and all of that is a, a collective effort. So I, I guess I'd sum it up by saying that on the one hand, it's really two sides of the same coin, Borge. One is that um, we're determined, and I keep hearing this everywhere I go, that countries continue to look to the United States to be engaged and, and to lead. Uh, and I think there's a recognition that in the absence of that engagement, in the absence of that leadership, then one or two things happens. Either someone else is doing it, maybe not in the most positive ways, or maybe worse, no one is doing it. And then you have a vacuum that's filled by bad things before it's filled with good things. But the other side of the coin is that, as I said, um, more than at any time since I've been involved uh, in these issues, which goes back 30 years now, more than 30 years, we have to find uh, cooperative, collaborative responses because none of us have the ability to effectively uh, deal with these challenges alone. So we put a premium uh, on that uh, more than anything else. And again, I think you can see the results in the areas that I just mentioned. Thank you, Secretary. Uh, let's start with um, the latter, the region, mm. and the ongoing humanitarian catastrophe uh, in uh, Gaza. Uh, during the two last days, it's been said from many speakers that there will never be a two-state solution without uh, U.S. Uh, taking uh, leadership. But we also know that um, Egypt now presented uh, a ceasefire and the release of mm. uh, hostages uh, deal to Israel. We learned that it's now uh, with uh, Hamas, mm -hmm. and they will have uh, to decide maybe uh, what you mm -hmm. think are, are the prospects. I, I guess if Hamas then uh, doesn't accept this. Uh, I think Netanyahu has said that uh, then he will go full fledged uh, into Rafa. So your visit, uh, I guess, to Israel uh, tomorrow uh, will be uh, very important because I, I think we, there is a big fear in the region that uh, for a further escalation. Well, I think there's a lot to be said about this, of course, um, but to try to put it in a nutshell, um, a few things are important. One, uh, we strongly support Israel in its effort to ensure that what happened on October 7th never happens again. Uh, but at the same time, we are determined to do everything we can to bring an end to the terrible human suffering that we're seeing every single day in Gaza among children, women, men, who've been caught in a terrible crossfire of Hamas's making. Um, and so maximizing protection of civilians maximizing the support that gets to them. This is uh, very much our, our focus. Now, the quickest way to bring this to an end is to get to a ceasefire and the release of hostages. And as you said, there's been an extraordinary effort that's been made, and I really want to thank um, profoundly our friends from Qatar and Egypt who've been playing an instrumental role in, in trying to get this ceasefire and release of hostages. A major effort that's been made um, over the last couple of months to get to that ceasefire, to get the hostages out. And right now, as you said, uh, Hamas has before it a proposal that is extraordinarily, extraordinarily generous uh, on the part of Israel. And in this moment, the only thing standing between the people of Gaza and a ceasefire is Hamas. They have to decide, and they have to decide quickly. Uh, so we're, we're looking to that, um, and I'm hopeful that they will make the right decision and we can have a fundamental change in the, in the dynamic. 
But uh, let's say that Hamas turns it down. Mm. Uh, you will still recommend uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu tomorrow not to go ahead uh, with that attack on, on Rafah? We've said clearly and for some time now uh, on, on Rafah that in the absence of a, a plan to ensure that uh, civilians will not be, um, uh, will not be harmed, uh, we can't support a, milit a major military operation in, in Rafah. Uh, and we have not yet seen a plan that gives us confidence that civilians can be effectively protected. But um, if there uh, is an agreement, ceasefire, mm -hmm. release of uh, some uh, hostages, uh, there will then need to be a plan uh, for the way uh, forward. And uh, the That's right. destructions in, in Gaza uh, is like a war zone now. But will there be any appetite from any donor uh, to support a rebuilding without a political plan because mm -hmm. uh, it was rebuilt uh, 10 years ago after the last war and invested billions. And I, I guess uh, there is also no donors today that want to do this again without mm -hmm. a, a political path. And, and do you think there can be a political path? And, you know, with Hamas still there, it's going to be uh, complicated because I, I guess Gaza has to be run um, than uh, by others, than, than Hamas. Well, one of the benefits of being here is to be able to see all of my, my colleagues, and we have been um, meeting and talking on a, a continuous basis since October 7th, but particularly since the beginning of the year, looking really at two things. Um, the need uh, to be ready for a day after plan for Gaza, to include what is to be done about security, what is to be done about governance and administration, what is to be done about the humanitarian and reconstruction needs. Uh, and uh, a lot of work has been done on that. More work needs to be done so that uh, we uh, can be ready. At the same time, I think it's clear that in the absence of a um, real political horizon uh, for the Palestinians, um, it's going to be much harder, if not uh, impossible, to really have a coherent plan for Gaza itself. So we're working on that as well. Uh, and all I can tell you in this moment is uh, a lot's gone into this. I think um, many of these things are, are, are achievable, but we still have a lot of work to do. And that's what we're here to do, and that's what I'm here to do in part uh, on this trip. But let me say something else. I think we really can see two paths forward for the uh, region as a whole, as well as for uh, Israelis and Palestinians in particular. Um, there's a path forward where the region is genuinely integrated, where Israel has normal relations with its neighbors, something that it sought since its creation, where Palestinians uh, have their legitimate aspirations met for a state of their own, um, and where we end once and for all a cycle of violence, a cycle of destruction, uh, a cycle of profound insecurity, and where the preeminent challenge, the preeminent threat to virtually every country in the region, Iran, is um, in a box, is isolated, because the region has come together in this way. Um, so that's, I think, a path that you can see, we can see very clearly. Um, and again, the other path is that path of an endless cycle of insecurity violence, destruction that has caused so much suffering and uh, that needs to end. But it requires everyone concerned to make difficult, real decisions about the, about the future. Um, I think our job is to clarify those choices, clarify those decisions, and make sure that we're doing everything possible to provide the support necessary for anyone who's ready to make hard decision about the future. And I know you're meeting with uh, your G7 colleagues mm -hmm. here today, but also um, the key uh, foreign ministers uh, from the region, some of them sitting here on the first row, uh, listening uh, very carefully uh, to uh, what you're saying. I think one of the things that you've been working hard on is a normalization plan also between the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and Israel. And 
I think one of the preconditions there, I guess, will be from the kingdom that there is a clear path mm -hmm. to a two-state two solution. And yesterday it was also made very clear from many speakers here that um, what is fueling also this crisis is, of course, the Palestinian, unsolved Palestinian mm -hmm. issues. And if that was solved, it would also uh, take a lot of momentum out of uh, Iran and its proxies, right. uh, some speakers That's right. uh, said uh, yesterday. Uh, do you feel that there is progress on the Saudi-Israeli peace? And do you feel that the Israelis sees uh, the connection between uh, the momentum for uh, Iran and their proxies based on uh, the big impasse that we faced for decades on the Palestinian issues? Is you? Uh, so, uh, first, um, I think the single biggest, most effective rebuke to both Iran and, and Hamas would be um, Israel having normal relations with uh, every country in this region and uh, the realization of a Palestinian state. Um, of course, both Hamas and uh, Iran have opposed a two-state solution. So almost by definition, achieving it would be a profound rebuke to everything that they've stood for and destroyed for in over many years. Second, when it comes to normalization, look, I'm not going to uh, speak for our, our hosts here except to say that um, we have done intense work together over the last months. And in fact, well before October 7th, this is what we were focused on. And in fact, um, I was scheduled to be in the region, to be in Saudi Arabia and in Israel on October 10th, a trip that didn't happen because of October 7th, to focus specifically on the Palestinian piece of any normalization agreement, because that is, as you said, uh, an essential component. Um, I think, look, uh, the work that Saudi Arabia and the United States have been doing together in terms of uh, our own agreements, uh, I think, is potentially very close to completion. But then, in order to move forward with normalization, two things will be required. Calm in Gaza and a credible pathway to a Palestinian state. Uh, so to the extent we finish our work uh, between us, then I think what's been a hypothetical or a theoretical question suddenly becomes real. And people will have to make decisions. Secretary, just shortly, you, you went from China and back to uh, the sea for a day or, or two, and I, I guess you also seen what is unfolding uh, at many campuses uh, at leading universities um, uh, in the U.S. as a reaction to what is happening. Emotions, the profound feelings that uh, many people have at uh, the suffering that so many people are enduring, and in particular, uh, the innocent. reflected in what people are saying, um, what they're doing. Uh, I don't hear anything said about Hamas. Um, I don't hear anyone reflecting on the fact that, obviously, the atrocity of October 7th never should have happened, but once it happened, everything could have been over in an instant if Hamas had stopped hiding behind civilians, put down its weapons, given back the hostages and surrendered. None of the suffering that we've seen since would have happened. So where is the demand on Hamas? There's been silence. It's almost as if it's been erased from the story. That's something that I think we also need to reflect on. Even as I say, I, I profoundly understand the, um, the deep emotion that uh, the people are expressing, whether it's on our campuses or other places.
When, when you were um, in China, you uh, raised a lot of uh, questions uh, to the Chinese leadership. You met with President Xi Jinping and, of course, uh, your counterpart, uh, Foreign Minister uh, Wang Yi. Uh, one thing I, I saw you also ask China uh, to nudge uh, Iran mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to this uh, crisis, because we are very close to a full escalation uh, two weeks ago uh, between Israel and Iran. We avoided that, but uh, well, what was the response when you raised this with uh, Wang Yi to, uh, to nudge Iran? Well, two things. First, Borg, as you said, uh, we did come very close to uh, an escalation, a spread of the conflict, and I think because of very focused, very determined efforts, um, we've been able to avoid it. And that's usually important. Uh, and this is something we've been on since day one, trying to make sure that um, even as we work to resolve Gaza, we don't see this conflict spread to other places in the region. Second, with regard to China, they have a, a clear, obvious interest in stability in, in the Middle East. Uh, they obviously depend on the region for uh, energy resources. Um, there are many vital trading partners here. Ninety percent of the oil come, uh, ninety percent of the exactly. Iranian oil, I think, is bought by China. Yeah. Well, there's that too, which is another, another challenge. But uh, you start with the premise that they have an interest in stability here. They also have relationships. They have influence. And so the question that I raised with, uh, uh, with our Chinese counterparts is, given that, um, we would urge you to use the influence because it's in your interest. And also, it's something that other countries would look to China to do. So I think we've seen some uh, examples of that, and uh, that's a positive thing. Uh, but again, it goes to their own self-interest. Yeah, because I think China played a role in the rapprochement between the kingdom and Iran, even if I think you were um, part of it too, but uh, China played a role mm -hmm. there. Uh, they did, and it's something that we, uh, that we supported, because again, if um, we can find through diplomacy ways to ease tensions um, and to avoid, uh, avoid any conflict, that's a good thing. Uh, and to the extent China can play a constructive role in advancing that, that's good too. I think you, you had other topics that you raised with Wang Yi too. One of them was uh, your concern over China's support for Russia's mm -hmm. defense industry. What did Wang Yi uh, respond to that one? Well, I raised this both with um, my counterpart Wang Yi, as well as with President Xi, uh, directly. And let's understand what's going on. Um, we have um, engaged with China from the start of the Russian aggression against Ukraine and urged them not to provide uh, Russia with, uh, with arms, with weapons that would fuel the uh, aggression. And I think it's fair to say that uh, China has not directly supplied Russia with, uh, with weapons, with missiles, with uh, uh, munitions. Iran is doing it. North Korea is doing it. However, what China is doing is providing um, invaluable support to Russia's defense industrial base that's helping Russia um, deal with the massive pressure that's been exerted through sanctions, through export controls, and other measures. If you look at what Russia's done over the last year in terms of its production of munitions, missiles, tanks, and armored vehicles, it's produced them at a faster pace than at any time in its modern history, uh, including uh, during the Cold War as the Soviet Union. How has it been able to do that? Because it's getting massive inputs of machine tools, microelectronics, optics, mostly coming from China. 70% of the machine tools, 90% of the microelectronics are coming from China. Now, these are dual-use items, but we know very clearly where so many of them are going. And this poses two problems. It is enabling uh, Russia to continue the aggression against Ukraine, so it's perpetuating a war that China says it would like to see come to an end, as all of us would. But second, it's also um, enabling Russia to rebuild a defense industrial base that countries throughout Europe are deeply concerned will be turned against them after Ukraine is done. And so at the very time that Russia is seeking better relations with countries in Europe, it's also fueling the greatest challenge to European security since the end of the Cold War. And as I shared with my Chinese colleagues, you can't have it both ways.
What was their reaction? Did they, uh, did they promise to then not supply 70% of not, the uh, machine tools? It wouldn't those? be fair of me to, uh, to speak for them or characterize their response. Let's see what actually happens. But, 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 but you're hopeful. I'm not going not gonna to put a label on it other than to say they've heard us clearly, but I think as important, maybe more important, they're hearing this from European countries. Um, I've talked to a number of European leaders about this in, in recent weeks, uh, including, for example, President Macron in, in, in France, and I know the um, deep concern that Europeans have about this support for the defense industrial base in Russia, because again, this poses a threat to Europe's security, not only Ukraine, but all of Europe. I, I also um, saw that uh, in the meeting between uh, you and President Xi Jinping, he said that uh, at least the Chinese media mm. reported uh, uh, the following, that uh, the U.S. and China should be partners, mm. not uh, rivals, and seek mutual success rather than harming each other. Mm -hmm. What was your response to that? Well, look, let's look where we've been over the last year. Um, I went to China uh, almost a year ago, um, first trip that um, anyone from the administration had made at a, at a senior level to China because President Biden was determined uh, that we would manage responsibly the relationship between our two countries. He believes that's something that's a, a requirement and that the rest of the world looks to us to manage it responsibly. And that starts with communicating. It starts with making sure that we have sustained engagement uh, at every level of our government with our Chinese counterparts. And it's a reflection of the fact that, as I said, the, the relationship is incredibly complex and it, it's uh, clearly very competitive, but we want to make sure that competition does not veer into conflict. And the best way to do that is to be talking, to be engaged. Um, there are aspects where we're directly contesting each other, uh, but there are also places where we're cooperating. And you start again by engagement, by talking, and after my trip, we had uh, other colleagues go to China, and then most important, President Biden and President Xi met uh, at the end of last year on the margins of the APEC summit outside of San Francisco. And they agreed that uh, we would work to make sure that we were responsibly managing the relationship, putting as much stability into it as we possibly could, um, dealing directly with our differences, but also looking to see if there were areas where we can cooperate. And uh, they identified a couple of areas. One, making sure that we actually restored the military-to-military -military communications that we had, but that had been interrupted. Absolutely essential to trying to make sure that we don't have a miscommunication, a misunderstanding that leads to conflict. That's been restored. And we now have uh, these communications between our militaries at every level from the Secretary of Defense and the Joint Chiefs uh, on down. Second. Uh, looking for areas where it made sense for us to actually cooperate. One of those is on the scourge of synthetic opioids. The number one killer of Americans between the ages of 18 and 45 is a synthetic opioid, fentanyl. And just think about that for a second. Let that sink in. It's not guns. Uh, it's not uh, cancer. It's not automobile accidents. It's a synthetic opioid. And the nature of this challenge is that Chemicals that are made for perfectly legal pur purposes can be manufactured on one, one side of the globe and then diverted to criminal enterprises that turn it into an opioid. And that's what's been happening in the United States. But this problem where we've been a canary in the coal mine, it's hit us hard, it's hit us first, we now see spreading around the world. Um, and as our own market gets saturated, we see um, these criminal enterprises developing markets in Europe, uh, in Asia, uh, in Latin America. Now, sometimes it's fentanyl, sometimes it's ketamine, sometimes it's uh, captagon, sometimes it's methamphetamines, but we see the spreading. It's why we put together a coalition of uh, more than 140 countries to work on this. But China has a critical role to play because it's a huge chemical manufacturer, and we found, not by intent, uh, that um, many of the chemicals that are used to synthesize fentanyl start in China, get sent near us, typically to Mexico, turned into fentanyl, come into the United States, kill a lot of people. So we sought to um, see if we couldn't cooperate together. And we now have that, that cooperation. And we've seen positive steps that China's taken uh, in terms of um, uh, 
taking down some of the companies that are involved, putting in place new regulations. More needs to be done, um, and this is what we talked about on this trip, to really carry this forward. But it's, it's progress, and it's a demonstration that we can work together when it's in our mutual interest to do it. Um, we're now going to have a dialogue on artificial intelligence. Really important that our countries talk about the risks, uh, the safety issues attendant to AI, which is going to be one of the defining technologies of, uh, of the coming years. We need some traffic rules there on we do. cyber crime, on uh, climate change, on future pandemics, and all that. Uh, Secretary, I know you have a busy agenda for peace here. You, you, we, there is a lot to be achieved uh, in the coming hours. I don't want to take too much of your uh, time. Uh, but maybe uh, last questions coming back to the situation in Europe and uh, Ukraine. Mm. Uh, the Congress uh, did pass uh, $61 billion, uh, to Ukraine. Uh, it was not an easy road. Um, the Ukrainians uh, appreciated uh, this a lot. Uh, but is there a path towards an end mm. of the Ukraine uh, war? Uh, we're talking about breaking impulses and all this, but it's very hard to see uh, that uh, what, what such an end uh, could, could be. Well, look, it depends mostly on Vladimir Putin and what he decides. Now, I think uh, Putin has believed that he can outlast Ukraine and outlast Ukraine's supporters. The success in, as we say, better late than never, getting the supplemental budget request uh, is a demonstration that uh, we're not going anywhere. That support is continuing, and in fact, the 61 or so billion dollars is, as we speak, moving forward. Um, and that's critical, because I think it's both a practical and, and psychological boost to Ukrainians, who have had a tough um, nine months or so, uh, but also a clear demonstration that um, the support remains and it endures. Beyond that, there are a number of things that are happening that I think are a demonstration that we're in this for Ukraine to be strong in the long haul and to stand strongly on its own two feet militarily, economically, democratically. Militarily, beyond the support that we're providing in the immediate and Europeans are providing. And by the way, I, I said this before, but we often talk about uh, the challenges of burden sharing. I've never seen a better example of burden sharing than in the case of Ukraine where European partners, Asian partners, others, uh, for as much as we've done, have done even more. And that continues. But even as we're dealing with the immediate needs of Ukraine, we have now more than 30 countries that have negotiated or will soon complete negotiations on bilateral security agreements with Ukraine that will help it stand up a future force that can deter aggression and defend against aggression into the future. At the same time, we're driving private sector investment into Ukraine. Uh, there are tremendous opportunities despite the difficult circumstances, and we're seeing tremendous interest in that. And even the initial success with that, including Ukraine's success in making sure that the Black Sea is open again to its commerce, it's actually exporting more through the Black Sea now than it was before February of, um, uh, of 2022. Uh, revenues are going into the state coffers. Um, you can see a future where Ukraine will be strong economically. And then democratically, the European Union open accession talks with Ukraine. That's the best pathway to deepening Ukraine's democracy. All of that is the strongest possible answer to, uh, to Putin, because it says that Ukraine will not only survive, it can thrive going forward. So I hope that um, Mr. Putin gets the message and demonstrates a willingness to genuinely negotiate consistent with the basic principles that are at the heart of the uh, international community and the UN Charter. Sovereignty, territorial integrity, uh, independence. Um, if those are appropriately affirmed, uh, there should be uh, a resolution. Last thing I'll say on this is that if you step back and look at it, I believe that this aggression by Russia has been a strategic debacle for Russia. Um, this, it's had to make this massive effort that we talked about in, in trying to get around export controls and sanctions, but it's um, reoriented its economy in a way that is not sustainable. It may work in the near term, it can't be sustained in the long term. Um, and in the aggregate, Russia is weaker economically, it's weaker militarily given the destruction of so many of its 
uh, forces, um, and it is uh, weaker diplomatically in much of the world. Not all of it, but in much of it. Uh, at the same time, Ukrainians are united in ways that they have never been before, including united against Russia, which was not the case before 2014 when Russia committed the first aggression uh, against Ukraine. Uh, and as I mentioned before, the NATO alliance, a defensive alliance with no uh, designs on Russia, never has had them, never will have them, is stronger and larger than it was with uh, two countries, uh, Finland and, and Sweden, that no one thought would be interested in joining NATO uh, a few years ago and now are members of the alliance. And of course, Europe has moved itself away from dependence on, on Russian energy in extraordinary ways in just the space of two years. All of this represents, I think, um, a huge strategic setback for Russia. In many ways, Putin has precipitated many of the things he's sought to prevent. I hope that there's recognition of that. Uh, and look, the minute that Russia demonstrates that it's genuinely willing to negotiate, um, we'll certainly be there. And I believe the Ukrainians will be there. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Secretary. It has been a uh, tremendous uh, tour de horizon, but it will not end with us because uh, excellent Tom Friedman you're seeing walking there. Tom is going to moderate the next uh, session. So I'm the opening act for Tom. Uh, yes, right? so we, we're the curtain raiser for Tom. I think he likes that. That's, uh, yeah, that's he will have a panel of uh, key foreign ministers uh, taking up uh, the discussion, but uh, uh, thank you so much, uh, Secretary Tony, for your leadership you. and uh, for your hard work. Thank, thank you, you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you.